Hi, Bill Quistorf here, Chief Pilot for Snohomish County Sheriff's Office here in Washington State. And I'm here to tell you about Snowhawk 10. This is our Bell UH-1H helicopter that's been significantly modified in 2004 and 2011. So I'm going to cover some of the modifications and we'll answer some of your questions. In 2004, we had the tail boom modified on Snowhawk 10 up in Bellingham at Helipro. We had a Bell 205 tail boom added and Bell 212 tail rotor components. That significantly added weight to the tail boom and the CG was uh, shifted aft, so we added some ballast here in the nose to counteract that uh, additional aft CG. Uh, we have a lead acid battery, 24 volt DC. That's our primary DC uh, source of power. And we switched over from the original military nickel cadmium or NICAD batteries over to lead acid. So it's a lead acid battery. Then we have our avionics components for our, all, all our new Garmin systems, uh, the Garmin GH500 and the Garmin 430s, along with uh, our engine uh, readout. I'm up here on top of Snowhawk 10 and sitting next to the Donaldson air filtration system for the engine. This was a modification done in 2011. This is the, another mod. We increased power by adding the Lycoming L703 engine. That replaced the T53 L13 engine. So we went from 1850 shaft horsepower to 2400 shaft horsepower. And that's significant when we operate at high altitudes in the Cascade Mountains, which we do normally. Uh, we operate anywhere from 6,000 to 9,000 feet on a typical rescue mission. Along with all the crew members and all the rescue gear we have, we need, we need that extra power. Another feature I'd like to point out is the Military Oil Debris Detection System, ODDS. It has a fine mesh metal screen inside that catches any debris. Uh, also has an engine chip detector, which will pick up any engine uh, chips, any metal chips, uh, in addition to the chip detector on the N1 gearbox on the engine. Another feature that's been added is the high skid gear. Uh, we've got the Dart high skid gear. It's not the extreme high skid gear, it's kind of the, the mid-range, but if you look at the original Bell UH-1H, it's got lower skid gear. Uh, and then because of that, uh, Higher profile, we've added the flight step, make it easier to get in and out of the cabin. And on the back of the skid gear uh, at the heel, we've added the bear paw or tundra pad. And what that does is spread out the weight that's back there. Most of the weight when we land is on the aft uh, part of the skid gear. And if we're operating in soft terrain like uh, riverbank, muddy area, uh, loose gravel or snow, that helps uh, prevent that aft skid gear from sinking down and then further prevents or helps prevent the uh, possibility of dynamic ro rollover when that skid gear becomes trapped in the mud or debris as we take off. Here we have the strakes kit, uh, both the lower and the upper strakes. Uh, they're only added on the aircraft left side. Uh, there are no strakes on the right side of the aircraft. And these drakes are actually made at Boundary Layer Research right here in Everett at Payne Field. This aircraft, Snowhawk 10, was the first UH-1H uh, in the country to have strakes uh, put on an operational aircraft. So we've had them on the aircraft for uh, over 20 years now. So the purpose of the strakes is to break up the airflow over the tail boom from the main rotor system as the main rotor system passes over the tail boom. It breaks up that airflow, and you've got less weather vaning of the tail boom from the, uh, from the effect of that aerodynamic effect of that wind passing over the tail boom. And so you're putting in a lot less pedal, especially at, uh, during takeoff, any change in power, you're putting a lot less left pedal in, increase in power, and uh, it makes the uh, tail rotor authority uh, a lot more effective too. Here at the aft end of the tail boom, we have the synchronized elevator. And just a, a safety feature uh, to prevent somebody from walking this really sharp edge on the sink elevator, we just took a piece of pipe insulation, uh, tagged it with, with some high-vis 
webbing and that prevents any injury if somebody accidentally walks into there. Another modification to the tail boom is the boundary layer research fast fin kit. Uh, originally the vertical fin on the Huey is about a third as wide and so a third of that vertical fin is removed and this fiberglass cap is attached here and that increases the effectiveness uh, and the thrust uh, of the tail rotor system. Um, it's really effective on the original Bell UH-1H or Bell 204 with the smaller tail rotor system here on the left side. We've added the Bell 212 tail rotor system and so we've got a lot more thrust. Uh, it's a tractor tail rotor system versus a pusher. So um, it's really effective up in the mountains. On this aircraft, uh, I have never run out of left pedal up in the mountains at high altitude on any operation where you know, we've adjusted our, our weight and uh, did, the, did the rescue. We've never run out of left pedal on this one. Here we are at the tail rotor system. We've got the Bell 212 tail rotor blades, the 90 degree gearbox and the 42 degree gearbox originally off the Bell Cobra. Uh, one thing that was changed on this aircraft, uh, we went away from the cable and chain from the original UH-1 to control uh, the pitch change on the tail rotor system and we went to push-pull tubes all the way down uh, from the beginning of the tail boom all the way up here to the 90 degree gearbox. It's all push-pull tubes. So in order to accomplish that, we had to go to a, a bigger tail rotor servo system that was installed. and um, that's been very effective and had, we've had no issues at all with um, tail rotor control. So you can see here inside the interior of their tail boom that Northwest Helicopters did a superior job of renovation. They completely stripped this aircraft down to the sheet metal, repainted it, not only primed it, but put a high gloss finish on the interior throughout the aircraft. Beautiful work. In 2007, we added the rescue hoist system. It's a Goodrich rescue hoist rated at 2,500 pounds and limited to 600 pounds. Uh, prior to that, we were doing live short haul operations off the cargo hook. Uh, we typically operate with a 150 foot short haul line. And now, since we've got the rescue hoist, uh, we go on station, we insert our team and rescue gear and then uh, fly away, usually land somewhere for about 20, 30 minutes until they're finished packaging. Then we fly back in, pick up our flight medic, uh, pick up the litter, and then pick up our rescue technician. And then everybody's safe on board and we can depart the area. Whereas before in a short haul operation, you pick everyone up, uh, you've got to fly them externally down the mountain to a meadow or somewhere open, uh, wide riverbank and set them down, then land, and disconnect everything, load it inside, and then fly. So the operation itself is a lot quicker, cleaner, safer operation for everybody involved. In 2011, we had the aircraft significantly modified, overhauled by Northwest Helicopters in Olympia. They took the aircraft, stripped it down to the sheet metal, removed every single component, fuel lines, hydraulic lines, electrical, uh, everything inside and cleaned it up, inspected it all, and started putting it back together. So there a lot of uh, modifications were done, especially in the cockpit and cabin areas, uh, and everything was inspected, parts replaced, all our rotating components were overhauled to zero towel, and we had a new paint job put on. So we're really proud of this. Uh, one of the things that I requested uh, Northwest Helicopters to do was create a custom crew chief position or crew chief station and that's what we have here. Uh, originally I started out as a UH-1 crew chief door gunner back in the day and I know uh, uh, usually the crew chief doesn't have a very comfortable position so we changed that and Northwest Helicopters had this custom seat made, cushioned. Uh, originally there was a bench seat here with a two position seat on the military system uh, with no padding and so uh, the crew chief has a good position here. He operates the hoist. He can clear the tail rotor, tail rotor system when we're operating the main rotor system on this side. So the crew chief uh, station, all his controls are right here, primarily the pendant for the hoist control. There's a rheostat on the pendant that operates the hoist up or down. 
Uh, he's got a power switch up here on his ICS box that controls his radio system, intercom. And he's got a power switch for a uh, searchlight. Searchlight's mounted right below his seat on the belly. So this button here controls the searchlight uh, up and down, fore and aft, and he can direct that searchlight at night for night operations. So rather than uh, the pilots trying to control the light, the searchlight up front, he's got his own searchlight back here, so that's really effective. Uh, one thing on the pendant that was changed and modified, originally this uh, button back here was push to talk for intercom that we don't use, so it's been wired for our water bucket operations and where we're flying uh, fires on fires and we have a bucket full of water, the crew chief calls it and we say mark and then he releases the water bucket, uh, drops the water, and he controls opening and closing with that red switch right there. Also back here we've got the axle cut. This is a backup system for the hoist cable in case we needed to cut that. There is an actual uh, squib in the housing of the hoist that we can activate electronically, but if that fails, we've got a manual device to cut the cable in an emergency. Uh, this little container here is for ice axes. We operate on the glaciers on occasion, and so we insert our teams. They need to go down with ice axes. We don't like to carry them uh, on board in the cabin loose, so they're secured back here. And prior to going down on the glacier, they're handed the ice axe, secure it to their harness, and then they go down. Same thing on the way back up. They just reverse it, hand it to the crew chief. He clips it in here, uh, and the pole goes inside that container. Just to tell you a little bit about our rescue gear, we've got this bag right here, and it contains a break-apart cascade litter along with packaging for a patient who's non-ambulatory. Uh, the seat there, the passenger seat next to that, actually folds up real quick and then the full length litter fits inside here. Uh, this facing jump seat right here that is the tech rescue seat. So the rescue technician will sit in there. And then next to him is our flight medic. All our flight medics are full-time paramedics at a fire agency within the county here and they volunteer their time here. So uh, our flight medics are volunteers, uh, rescue technicians are volunteers, and we have volunteer crew chiefs and pilots. So the typical operation is we come on scene, uh, after we do our full checklist, the crew chief will, will step out on the skid. He's secured to a harness to this hard point up here. Um, and he'll lower the rescue hook. He'll hand it to the rescue tech. And then he'll lower the rescue tech, uh, lower the flight medic. And then he'll unclip this rescue bag from the floor. And he'll go ahead and lower this rescue gear to the team on the ground. We'll fly away, uh, like I said, about 20, 30 minutes, come back on station, pick everybody up, load them internally, and then we'll fly either to an aid car, hospital, helipad, or if it's a significant injury, we'll go to Harborview in Seattle. Here we are in the cockpit of Snowhawk 10, and there have been significant upgrades, modifications to this. Basically, this is a whole new instrument panel, console panel, uh, the seats, the aircraft controls. So everything in the cockpit and cabin has been built new by Northwest Helicopters in 2011. And we're very, very pleased with the setup and the instrumentation. Uh, the aircraft not only looks good, but it flies like a new helicopter. So we're, we're really pleased with it. Uh, some of the upgrades that we've had done, uh, we had the um, Garmin 500, uh, G500H added to um, the cockpit. It's a dual G500H, so we've got it on both uh, pilot and co-pilot sides. Um, we added the Garmin Dual 430s, uh, Wolfsburg. This is a dual band radio, so it's got both VHF for search and rescue and our 800 megahertz for uh, the sheriff's office, police, fire is on 800. Uh, new NAT intercom boxes. Uh, we've also had a um, uh, new load meter put on, a uh, new cargo hook installed, and so we've, we've got uh, a load meter attached to the cargo hook. We can measure the amount of weight, especially uh, when we're doing water bucket operations. We can determine you know, how much weight and how much water we're carrying. In addition to that, we've got the uh, fast 
the fast bucket system and that's automatically controlled here in the cockpit so uh, once it's all hooked up we just uh, dial this and this will increase or decrease the amount of water we start with about 40 percent bucket capacity the bucket is about 270 gallons full so we start at about 40 percent of that um, and with our full weight of fuel uh, plus the the weight of the water in the bucket um, that's probably our max to start out with and then as we burn down fuel quantity as the pounds of fuel burn down i can just reach over here and dial this up and increase the water bucket capacity so that's been really effective too uh, we have fire bucket water bucket drop uh, control up front and the crew chief also has it in the back and we primarily uh, control that with the crew chief. So our, our cockpit has been modified by the military for NVG operations. Now originally, the military was flying with NVGA night vision goggles. And so you see all the blue-green filters on everything, um, including the caution panel display has a blue-green filter. Uh, we've swapped over to NVGB model and so the, the B filters will allow us to view the colored images, the whites, the yellows, and they won't interfere with the goggles. So our displays have been modified with uh, NVG filters, and our goggles themselves have gone over to the NVGBs. One thing we recently added was our spider track system. Um, this keeps track of us. Anybody uh, who has access to the website that we give out uh, can track this aircraft uh, in flight real time. There's about a two minute delay, but uh, you can pull up Google Earth or any type of map system, satellite image, and you can actually watch us fly in real time on there. Uh, one thing I kept was the military, the radar altimeters on, on both uh, pilot sides. These are very, very accurate. Uh, they measure the AGL by one foot increments versus a lot of the civilian ones are you know 25 or 50 foot increments. So we're really uh, glad we kept these. And then just the overall layout of the of the cockpit and the instrument panel, uh, it's it's just well balanced. This is our monitor for our hoist camera. So we've got a small camera mounted on the hoist, pointed down. We can watch uh, hoist operations going on. Usually uh, the pilot flying, we fly with two pilots, uh, they're concentrating outside the aircraft and the non-flying pilot, whoever that, whichever seat that is, monitors uh, the hoist cam and talks on the radio, uh, monitors our power, all our power on the engine, making sure we're in safe margins. So that's a tour of Snowhawk 10. Uh, glad you joined us. If you have any questions, just send them here to the sheriff's office or send them to our videographer, Jason Fortenbacher at Fight to Fly Photography. Thank you.